Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach and Amazon best-selling author, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? I'm good, Nathan. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, man, and I am ready to jump in to this week's episode. But before we do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a side tangent real quick. You and one of the guests, previous guests of the show, did a a recent event to promote your book, and I wanted to hear all about it before we jump into today's topic. Sure. Well, um, Harlan Kilstein hosted a live Zoom call for for his list. Let me bring a few people in too, and we went really, really deep on persuasion stories, part one, and part two was we did a live copy critique from copy neither of us had seen. And I put the whole thing up on the YouTube channel uh, where you find copywriters podcast. So um, the channel is just my name. I tried to call it copywriters podcast, but I'm good with that stuff. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, it's, um, I think it's called special report persuasion stories in depth. And it's about an hour long and it's longer than any, you know, more in depth, rather more specific, um, especially for copywriters than anything I've done elsewhere, except the book, of course. And what kind of caught me off guard about that was the idea of doing a live copy critique. First time seeing the copy. How did that, how did that even happen? Well, we had people on the call um, submit their copy as they came on. I mean, none of this was sign up, prepare. It was just all in the moment. And, Another former guest of this podcast, Jim Van Wick, was expert moderator. He picked the best one. And we looked at the copy. It was about kayaking and a special maneuver you could do to stop falling over and kayak faster, stop capsizing. And I just asked questions. And the guy buried his lead. And he he got way too technical and way too advanced. And It wasn't because he was stupid. He wasn't. He was smart, but it was because of the curse of knowledge. I mean, you know, 50% of the copy critiques people know so much about, I do, people know so much about their products or their services or their software that they start too advanced and they don't explain it so a person can understand it and want to buy it. So they just asked questions and, I mean, once we got to the answer, it took a while, but once we got to the answer, the solutions were pretty straightforward to me. Um, I mean, they were a revelation to him, but to to me, I was able to say, well, you just here are the two things they want. Here are the two things that your method gives them and tell them, you yeah. know, and show them, have pictures of it, you know? And um, so uh, that's even, how it worked. Even as fairly skilled copywriters, especially when writing for our own services or products, we get kind of stuck in the frame and we are not able to see the whole picture. So having a good copywriter as a friend that you can kind of swap pieces with or having a mentor like you do at Garfinkel Coaching for people, so invaluable. So I I was curious as to how that went as a live experience. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into this week's episode and uh, talk about one of the things that I think gets lost on a lot of copy. And you kind of hinted at it actually in your discussion of what was going on with this particular person's copy. But the plain and simple fact that you have to be interesting. Otherwise, people are just not going to read your copy. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, it's a common mistake copywriters make but it's one you just can't afford to make because it can be fatal and that mistake is writing copy that's boring sometimes copywriters make the mistake of trying to put something funny in the copy but when that funny thing draws attention away from what you're trying to sell it doesn't work you definitely want to keep the focus and the tension going when you focus on the problem you're trying to solve and there are ways to do that that are still interesting, that don't detract from the sales appeal, the offer itself. And we're going to talk about a lot of them today. And we're also going to talk about this. Copy is powerful. Your 
are responsible for how you use what you hear in this podcast. I feel like uh, a guy at, at the horse races, right? <laughs> Most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, or business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So before we dive into a whole bunch of things you and I brainstormed that I, I just think are, are great, uh, easy ways to make your copy, keep your copy interesting, make it more interesting, I want to review a, a few basics, real short. David Ogilvy said it, you can't bore people into buying. Mm -hmm. David Deutsch, also a friend of this podcast on Twitter X said, the one thing a copywriter should fear when writing is being boring. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, we have to write our copy. That's how we make a living. That's how we sell our stuff. That's how we express our skills, our gift. But people don't have to read it. It's our job to entice them to read it. And keeping it interesting all the way through is how you do that. So today we're going to talk about three powerful techniques to keep your copy interesting, and we'll go in depth on each one. We'll also talk about a couple of um, whiffs, a couple of um, misses, a couple of things people do that don't work so well, that actually cut into the effectiveness of your copy. But before we go there, let's start with uh, some things. Let's start with the first one. And the first one has to do with one word, the word you. If you can translate or transform what you're writing from what it is to something, including the word you in a way that's natural and conversational, people will be more interested because people are mostly interested in themselves before anything else. With the exception perhaps of family, especially parents interested in their kids and kids are interested in their parents. But other than that, people are generally more interested in themselves than anything else. So one way to do this is just change a headline to include the word you. So instead of this headline, how to build washboard abs, right? You can just put you in there, how to build washboard abs you'll be proud of. All of a sudden it's, it's a lot more personally interesting. You can do the same thing in, in your lead. So if you have a one-click video production app, finally, a high-quality one-click video production app that's easy to use. That's not bad, but this is better. Finally, you get a high-quality one-click video production app that's easy for you to use. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts about that? Do you try and work the word you in right up at top? Yeah, they. one of the first rules that you learn as a copywriter is don't let your we, we show. Instead of saying we do this and we like this and we believe in this, let your you, you show. You deserve <laughs> this. We know that you are looking for this. Your life will be improved by this. I think there was a story of... a. Uh, a business owner arguing with his copywriter about this is a 17 page sales letter. I would never read a 17 page sales letter. And he says, of course you would. And he goes, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, let me tell you about you. And if I wrote 17 pages about you, you'd probably read it. So yeah, there's a lot of power in that three letter word you. Yeah, that's great. That And, and here's another way when you're describing your product, or in your offer. So instead of, this is the no brainer spreadsheet app that makes it easy to use a spreadsheet, even for people who aren't good with numbers. It's more interesting when you say, you'll find the no brainer spreadsheet app will make a spreadsheet easy for you, even if you're not good with numbers. Now, the whole idea of being able to use a spreadsheet may seem pretty boring, especially to words people, until you hear this post I saw on Twitter X yesterday. 
This is this post. I, I believe it's true, but who knows? Um, I protested my Austin property tax valuation appraisal back in May. Since then, they've sent me two settlement requests. Offer one, $20,000 or less. No. Offer two, $42,000 less. Me, no thanks. Them, fine. We'll see you at a hearing in a month. I show up to a virtual hearing today with a spreadsheet, and they were not ready. After hearing $271,000 lower appraisal value. Mm. Now spreadsheet sounds interesting, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. yeah, especially if um, you're in that position well, that was to me anyway yeah um, I mean I've never had property taxes lowered by 271,000 but I can imagine how happy I would be if I had alright um, another way to do this is to turn an impersonal statement into a question including you so um, imagine there's a product that protects people who are ticklish I mean, that must be terrible if you're ticklish. People always come up and tickle you, you know? <laughs> um, so instead of people who are ticklish would do anything not to be, you could say, have you ever said to yourself, I wish I could stop being ticklish? And imagine there's a smart lawnmower that doesn't miss anything, you know? I mean, I know they're smart. There's apparently a smart kitchen appliance that makes sandwiches. I mean, hmm. I don't even know where things are going. These days. Okay. But anyway, let's get back to the smart lawnmower. Um, so instead of saying, it's almost like this lawnmower can see around corners and has eyes in the back of its head. You could try something like this. Has anyone ever said to you, <laughs> looks like you missed a spot. Well, when you were mowing your lawn, maybe more than one spot. Okay. Um, kind of gets them where they live, doesn't it? Mm, yeah, especially if you're somebody who cares about your lawn, that's going to hit hard. Yeah, um, it's never been one of my most top priorities, but whatever. I know for a lot of people it is. Uh, you, All right. You have the beach as your lawn, so. That's true. And <laughs> it is, you know, as they say, San Francisco air conditioned by God. So we don't have to. <laughs> do a lot we have to do a lot but not with that so that's that's one thing the word you the second one is stories and of course the persuasion story code is a great thing to learn from but there are other things with stories that uh, we can talk about right now um, you've got one Nathan you want to talk about with dialogue right yeah so this is a really simple trick that I don't even know where I picked it up, but just including dialogue in your sales copy. So instead of saying, and then she went to the car and turned the key and the engine sputtered and then she was going to be late to work and it's a advertisement for an oil change service or something, having a dialogue on her way to the car, she told her husband, honey, I'll be there in, in 10 minutes. Don't worry about it. And he said, all right, I'll see you then. Just having those quotations, having that dialogue, having the people in your copy actually speak for some reason. And I don't I don't have any clue as to why this works, but it always draws people back in. And I've used things like uh, what is it? A hot egg or egg jar or something like that. Different um, tracking apps on websites to see where mouse over and eye attention goes and yep. having quotes, having dialogue in your sales pages always pulls people back into your copy. Yeah. So back to basic principles, people are most interested in themselves sometimes with the possible exception of family, but after themselves, they're more interested in other people than car ignitions or being on time for work. They're interested mm -hmm. in other people and the way you can convey other people is through actions and through words and the words work a lot better. They're a lot easier to take in. So that might be the reason. Um, and so, you know, we say, a lot of people say, don't confuse what they do in drama, TV and movies with 
copy. They're two different media. And they are. I mean, they're trying to entertain you on those things. And we're trying to sell something or persuade someone of something with our copy. But we do share one problem in common, and that is how to keep people's attention, you know, between the major plot points or um, the, the offer, the major parts of your copy. And so we can borrow techniques used to keep the drama and comedy on TV interesting minute by minute, and we can adapt it to our copy. You just mentioned the best one, I think, which is dialogue. Um, another, another thing you can use is conflict. And conflict doesn't have to be an arm wrestling match. It could be a mosquito bite. You know, it doesn't have to be a big obstacle. Uh, if you have someone um, wanting to do something, you learning a new skill or using a new technique or searching for a technique, simply trying one thing that didn't work, failing, cussing, and then trying a different way and succeeding, that's more interesting than getting it right the first time. Do you, do you ever throw obstacles into your stories or your your copy? Oh, it's a requirement. And I think of those short videos where somebody's trying to land a kickflip and they fail and they fall and they fail and they fall and they fail and they fall. And then the fifth time is when they stick it. And it's so much more gratifying than if you just saw that fifth time. And the same thing with copy. If you introduce the copy and it's like, hey, if you're somebody looking for this solution, this product will make it happen for you. That is so boring. If you go straight to Heaven Island and you don't spend a little bit of time on Hell Island first before you get to Heaven Island, Heaven Island isn't as satisfying. So starting off with some conflicts, some obstacles, a video game with no obstacles would be so boring to play. Sales copy with no pain points to overcome it's just boring to read yeah agree so a few other techniques from the entertainment world um you can use a little surprise take your story or your argument in a direction people wouldn't expect um, another one is humor and um, again don't tell jokes that are going to pull people's attention away from the main thing you're talking about. Don't put in absurd things like, oh, I don't know, an emu with a badge um, <laughs> to distract from your sales argument and pull the air out of the balloon. Um, but you can make a funny comment. I've, I've used this as an example. I had a friend, John Cantu, who worked for a while as a carny pitchman at a carnival, and he would sell uh, Shamu. And so um, he would say, you know, and if you have a problem with your golden reliever, oh, I mean your golden retriever. Okay, that's funny. It's not the world's greatest joke, but it'll keep him interested while he's, you know, demonstrating, hopefully cleaning something else up with a sham, uh, not a shamu, I'm sorry, a shammy. Shamu's the whale. And um, then, you know, the, the last thing are ahas or insights. If you can say something unexpected and, profound doesn't have to be you know the most profound thing coming on down from heavens but just an insight someone might not have had before about how things are or how something works or how to do something that, that can keep it interesting too yeah be careful when trying to use hum humor because that can blow up in your face especially when it's through the written word exclusively and uh, ahas and insights, I love those because they always make something more memorable. If you have something that causes an impact and makes your brain say, wait, what just happened here? That experience is always going to be more memorable for you. Yeah. Um, good. Okay, let's go to example three, other assorted techniques to keep it interesting. So the first one is questions, but be careful. I, and I've seen experienced people make this stupid mistake. Be careful with yes or no questions. Are you ready to, you know, you might have someone who's going to do something, but they're not ready. That's what the copy's for, right? 
So if you say, are you ready to? And they go, no, I'm not ready to. They might not keep reading, right? Do you want? No, the copy has got to help them realize that they want it. Some people reflexively answer no, and that can stop reading your copy right away. But a good open-ended question that does not have yes or no as an answer can really stoke the reader's imagination. I'll, mm. I'll give you three examples. What would it be like if you were twice as good at writing copy? If you could pick your perfect weight, what would it be? And of course, here's the best one. If you knew there was a great podcast about copywriting, how many people would you tell about it? Clever, I like that last one. I thought you would. I sure do too. Um, any any other thoughts on questions? No, I just know that you have to be very careful when you ask people questions. I know a lawyer who says, never ask a question unless you already know the answer. Yes. Okay, good point. Um, images. So writing in abstractions is amazingly boring. Including words that evoke images is incredibly powerful. Um, I'm going to give you a before and after or, a, a, you know, a one hand and the other. On the one hand, this new method removes the annoying inconveniences of summer versus our new 12 inch USB powered lantern zaps mosquitoes dead. Mm. See the difference? Yet mm -hmm. a, a lot of people, because they think in abstractions, they write in abstractions and they haven't translated it down to what's going to be interesting. Um, so, so you're not talking yeah. about, you're not talking about actual images or pictures in your sales copy. You're talking about using your sales copy to paint the picture. Right. You use the words that, that will paint the picture and, and get the person to see the image in their mind. Mm, okay. Yeah. And, and the use of, of images when they are demonstrating a frustration or, or a good experience or a result or a particular emotion associated with the benefit of the product. That can work. You need to know what you're doing, um, but that can work too. All right. And then the third thing is top of mind topics. Mm -hmm. So we had a really popular guest on last week, a lot of good feedback, Aaron Gensler. And he said on this show, he said, nothing beats top of mind. That is tying what you're writing into what's in the news. So from the week we're recording this, here are a few headlines. And I'll just throw this out as a question. How could you use each of these in your copy? This is from CNBC. The Federal Reserve leaves rates unchanged. Here's how it impacts your money. And here's... Um, a money headline from a very different point of view from the Drudge Report. Even millionaires afraid they'll outlive savings. Hmm. Okay. Here's one from the New York Times. Chat GPT can now generate images after OpenAI released a new version of its Dolly generator. So all of those, if someone's thinking about what can I use Chat GPT for? Or if you're selling, you know, if you're talking to investors, those top of mind things are going to draw them right in. Now, you've got to artfully transition into your pitch. And that's another story. But this keeps it very interesting. I'm going to give two tips on this. I call this news hijacking. And I use it a lot in emails. And I use it a lot in content creation, like YouTube videos. Uh, or TikTok videos or something like that. And it works because you're you're bringing up something people are already paying attention to. Who was it that said, join them in the conversation they're already having in their mind? Robert Collier. There you go. And this is exactly that. Now, I will say with the caveat, I don't use this tactic very often in 
sales pages or sales letters, especially if they're supposed to be evergreen or if they're supposed to be long lasting. But if it's content that goes out as a daily email or if it's content that goes out as a YouTube video that's only supposed to be getting views for the next couple of days anyways, this tactic works great. Yeah, I mean, top of mind was kind of invented by Agora, I think, and maybe Bill Bonner or Mark Ford. And and it, it it works best, I think, in the financial industry or in something that is very daily news related or oriented. Mm -hmm. But um, like you said, any any YouTube ad, um, maybe maybe the main sales page is evergreen, but the YouTube ad ought to be up to date current. Yep. Yep. And it always works that way. Yeah. So um, Nathan, you have a couple of cheap engagement bait tricks that blow up in your face. Okay. Yeah. So a couple of things that I feel are kind of cheap and they lose trust with people. And they also kind of cheapen your message, which is I'm 50 50 on this, but using emojis in your messaging, it works sometimes, but it also can backfire because it makes it look like a teenage girl is writing your sales copy. And depending on the market that can either work or it can blow up in your face. So I feel like you, you gotta be careful about who your market is when you use something like that. I'm sure you've seen messages like that, especially on Twitter or Facebook. And when it comes into emails, it's even a little bit more cringe in my opinion. When I see it in people's Twitter profiles, I think, my God, are they just a, a boiling cauldron of emotions? You know, not necessarily anger, but just all of this stuff coming out. <laughs> yeah. And then the other one is you introduced me to a guy, Brian, and he does the Baconator. It's kind of his brand is the Baconator copywriting stuff. Oh, and yeah. An episode you were talking with him and you guys were talking about a differentiator. You, we, we often talk about what makes you better or different than all of the other options out there in your market. And he brought up the fact that you can't just be different. You've got to be desirably different. Your, di your differentiator needs to be desirable to your market. So uh, maybe internet that, that marketer with face tattoos doesn't work because it's not very a desirable difference. Yeah. On the other hand, you've, you've had people tell you what, that, well, if, if you've got the balls to do that, you must be pretty good. I, you know, if you're willing, yeah, willing to have face tattoos and, and go out on the internet, I, I, I appreciate that level of courage. Yeah. Most of my clients actually, they say, Almost exactly that. Hey, if you can do your work and be well paid and pull off the face tattoos, you must be really good at what you do. Um, it was Brian Basilico, by the way. That that was yep. who who told us about that or who we discussed that with. Yeah. Um, so like here here's a here's a good con contrast I just thought of. Uh John Carlton is famous among many other things for um his one-legged golfer letter and mm -hmm. being one-legged and being able to drive um, a golf ball, you know, 300 yards without having all of the um, dynamic advantages of two legs and being able to swing your hips and whatever you do when you're playing golf, that's, that's differentiated. But a lot of people would try and knock that letter off without understanding the point. There was this, you know, one-legged accountant um, guy writes a letter. And, and the thing is, what's the point? The accountant has one leg. How, you know, I mean, I, 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 so, but people don't understand. And so you've got to, you, and, and I think that brings up a larger point. You've got to understand what's behind a technique. Mm -hmm. um, or you, you've got to be able to think through what was the psychology that made this interesting. Um, and you want to get down to basics sometimes. Okay. So, um, why don't we recap? We're, we're starting to run a little long, I think. Maybe, yeah, this uh, is a long episode. The main point is you can't make people read or listen or watch. You have to entice them. And you do this by constantly keeping your copy interesting. Um, one with assorted ways 
to use the word and the perspective you, Y-O-U. Um, the second one with minute-by-minute uh, -minute techniques of TV and movies, um, dialogue, conflict, surprise, humor, and ahas, um, and insights. Three, with questions, images, and top-of-mind topics. But as Nathan wisely pointed out, don't use cheap engagement bait that blows up in your face. Mm. And I just want to add to the very end of this episode, as more and more copy transitions into video, because you mentioned you can't force people to read and more and more people are tuning out of the reading experience and tuning more into the video experience. These rules also apply in video and it's probably smart to go back and re-listen to the episode and maybe listen to some of the stuff with that lens as well. If you're writing for VSLs or if you're writing for uh, YouTube ads or anything like that, a lot of this stuff is just as applicable to scripted video content as it is to written sales copy yeah in fact um okay the, the first one is with the word you is probably biased a little more towards written although it definitely makes a lot of sense spoken but the second and the third group are pretty much from video and that's mm -hmm. that's where we got them um not all of them but a lot of them so so yeah this stuff will work very well with video as well all right so if you're a direct response written copywriter, or if you're a copywriter that works in video, video sales letters, video advertising, and you enjoyed this episode and you want more of it, head on over to copywriterspodcast.com. While you're there, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite video or podcast app. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later.